Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this month's ARA Webinar Wednesday program. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's program, which is entitled Non-Destructive Evaluation Technologies for Detecting Utilities. Next slide, please. I'd like to first uh, cover a few housekeeping details with everyone. If you're experiencing an issue with your sound and you're using your computer speakers, please mute your speakers and then dial in using your phone. If you continue to have an issue, please use the chat button and send a message only to the host. We'll do our very best to assist you. Next slide, please. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the entire program. Those questions will be addressed at the conclusion of today's technical program, which will be approximately 45 minutes in length. If you do have questions, you can submit them during the entire program. Please click, as seen on this slide, the Q&A button, and send your question, and please listen carefully, send your question to the host and to the panelist. Next slide, please. To view the presentation in full screen mode at the top of your webinar settings as shown in this slide, please click the down arrow, highlight view, and then choose fit the viewer. Just a reminder, to receive the one hour PDH certificate for today's program, you must attend the full session for the entire hour. We'll be providing additional information on this topic at the conclusion of the presentation. We will also be making available to all the participants a PDF version of today's slide program. Next slide, please. Now is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ms. Vanessa Napoli. Vanessa is a senior scientist at ARA's AMA division as a member of the Geophysical Models Signatures and Systems Group. She's a geophysicist who focuses in seismic and acoustic analysis applied to nuclear forensics. Vanessa specializes in estimating explosive yield and seismic magnitudes, as well as performing large-scale seismic data analysis and waveform modeling. She's also experienced in applying various geophysical surveying me methods to detect subsurface discontinuities and anomalies. Vanessa has been with ARA for over three years and briefly worked as a seismologist, excuse me, for seven years at Western Geophysical Corporation. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Vanessa, my very good friend as well. Vanessa. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here today talking about non-destructive evaluation techniques. Uh, here's a list of topics that we're going to cover. First, we're going to talk about the complexity and necessity of locating buried utilities and why we need non-destructive evaluation methods. From here on out, I'll refer to these as NDE methods. We will then talk about the state of current NDE techniques and the applications of these methods. I'll go over methodologies uh, and how these techniques work and also applications in both controlled lab settings and field experiments. And then we'll discuss what our recommendations for ND technologies are in various settings. We'll wrap up, uh, we'll talk about uh, recommended R&D for future development, and then uh, we'll finish with questions. Now, I do want to point out that the work you're seeing today came out of a contract that ARA had with the Federal Highway Administration. I have the contract number uh, listed here. Um, and as documents become published by Federal Highway, I encourage you to use them as a resource if you're interested in what you hear today. All right, let's jump into the background. Why do we need non-destructive evaluation technologies? So underground utilities represent fundamental assets in our infrastructure networks all throughout our cities and states. They provide us with essential services we are all very familiar with, including water, gas, sewage, telecommunications, power. Now managing these complex arrays of utility networks is challenging, as most of underground utilities are buried beneath public urban areas, and we're without comprehensive maps. 
So locating them is very difficult. And we need to be able to locate these utilities so we can consistently upkeep them, uh, which is critical to avoid outages that disrupt our community usage. No one's happy uh, when we uh, have an outage in utility networks, both on the provider and the consumer side. So we need to limit these when possible, especially as outages for extended periods of time can be dangerous and life-threatening. Additionally, highway and infrastructure construction require identification, characterization, and relocation of subsurface utility lines. And it has to be done in a timely, reliable, and cost-effective manner. Now, the biggest challenge we face today is the lack of existing or recorded information on the location, orientation, and also type of utility lines present. Especially for highway agencies, I mean, they don't always have regular lines of communication established with the utility providers. So all of this information is required so we can minimize outages, increase safety, and improve efficiency of utility upkeep. So we need NDE technologies because in the absence of these complete maps, traditional survey methods rely on physical verification, which is open cut practices, excavation, trenches, and these are time consuming. And generally they need to stick to strictly um, scheduled project activities. And when we go into excavation practices, this can be damaging to the underground utilities and the areas where the utilities are buried. Now, NDE methods, as their name implies, are non-destructive ways to survey buried utilities, as well as being applied uh, not just to utility detection, but a large variety of geophysical practices. And they can increase uh, our efficiency of data collection and processing, as well as minimizing those outages since we do not need to do any subsurface evaluation. So now we know why NDE methods are helpful, but it's most important to know when to use each method. We need a comprehensive guide to lay out in different situations which ND method will help you the most. Let's say you have metal utility lines 10 feet beneath a highway, or you have PVC water lines underlying grass and it's been raining for two weeks, or you have unknown utilities at a whole range of depths. How do you know which method to use when? The Federal Highway Administration identified this as a critical need uh, to identify the availability, feasibility, and reliability of existing NDE technologies, and to develop a comprehensive procedure for deploying appropriate NDE systems in a variety of settings and configurations. As many of you know, this is far from the first time that NDE methods have been tested and evaluated for detecting buried utilities, uh, but technologies are constantly evolving and our needs are changing as well. A substantial development in NDE documentation was the SHARP-2 report, which uh, details results from the second strategic highway research program. Most of the research for this report was conducted between 2007 and 2013, with the final report published in 2018. On the right, I have a few of the most prominent NDE methods that were tested in that report, including single and multi-frequency GPR, acoustic methods, and TV, oh, FDEM, I should say. Now, what other methods are being used to detect and locate buried utilities since the SHARP-2 report? The objectives of the work under Federal Highway was to first investigate existing and emerging NDE technologies and literature and to poll various DOT offices to understand what technologies they're using and what challenges they're facing. The second step was uh, to design a controlled lab experiment so we could do an apples to apples comparison with different soil types, pipe materials, sizes, and depths. And third was to take uh, the technologies into a real world application and identify successes and challenges when we're in the field. And then we were tasked with combining uh, compiling all this and delivering a guide of recommended NDE technology that could be turned into a web manual. So since SHARP-2, uh, new approaches in GPR and acoustic technology have become widely available and other electromagnetic and seismic methods merited further investigation. So all the technologies shown here are ones that we research under this federal highway uh, contract. And the ones in light blue are ones that we have uh, considered emerging technologies or new technologies that sharp too. 
All right, so I've set the stage with some background information about complications of utility detection, why we need NDE methods, and mentioned some of the methods we're gonna look at. So we're gonna get into more details now. Uh, where did we start to know what the biggest challenges are with utility detections and what methods to investigate? We started with talking to the people that use NDE methods regularly. Um, we talked to nine Department of Transportation offices. This way we could get their input on what approaches and technologies they were using to detect and locate buried utilities. This consisted of both a written survey which with each office and a conversation over the phone as well. Uh, we asked them a variety of questions, uh, such as do you deploy your NDE tech internally or do you outsource it? What kind of tech do you use? What do you trust the most? Uh, what kind of data processing methods do you use? And what are your biggest challenges? And what are your biggest factors when considering new technology? Is it cost? Or is it time to train someone? Is it processing time? And we wanted to see if we could identify consistent gaps, challenges, and needs across multiple offices. Uh, some key findings included that states place highest trust in GPR, which was not shocking uh, to us or probably most people here today, um, and traditional line locators. But if they were to use new technology, accuracy of the technology is the largest factor, as well as automated processing. And the biggest challenge that they were facing was the need to close roadways. The vehicle mounted equipment is of high interest. We also have a full breakdown of our polling results and our final report delivered to Federal Highway, which will be published if you're interested in more of these uh, results. So while we were polling DOT offices, we began an in-depth literature search to research current and emerging NDE technologies. And this breaks down into four major categories, electromagnetic, magnetic, acoustic, and seismic. Although on our literature search, we go into all of these methods that you see here, today I'm gonna focus on the most promising technologies and the ones that we were able to test in lab and field settings. And these are these four methods shown here. Ground penetrating radar, frequency domain electromagnetic method, acoustic pipe locator, and multi-channel analysis of surface waves. So I'll go through these four methods in, in detail and describe the physical principles of them, and how they work. All right, so the first method, ground penetrating radar. It's a geophysical ND technique. It uses electromagnetic signals to detect and identify uh, subsurface anomalies. These detections are based on changes in electrical conductivity and relative dielectric properties of the subsurface layers. Now, GPR has been around since the 1970s, but today GPR can provide real-time feedback and results to the operator that allows them to mark utilities on site. Also, GPR is now GPS enabled, which can facilitate the generation of precise maps for project management and planning. GPR systems come in various sizes. So they can be ground coupled systems, like the one shown to the right, or they can be vehicle mounted, as I'll show you later. Now, looking at the diagram here, we have a ground coupled system. I can use my cursor too for you guys. A ground coupled system um, that will be pushed along a scan path. It uses an appropriate antenna configuration to send EM waves uh, into the ground that are shown in blue and uh, and then it will receive a response to the material and its contents for processing shown in orange. And the systems today can present these results in real time for the operator to visualize. Uh, here's another schematic drawing uh, to help us understand more how GPR works. Uh, this drawing shows an air coupled GPR system at the top here um, over a scan part a uh, path with rebarb and concrete uh, buried below the surface. So buried utilities, uh, or in this case rebarb, is defined by the signals returned to the receiver and the speed at which they are returned. There are other properties too that are contained in the signal. We have amplitude, attenuation, signal polarity, and wavelength. These signal responses are different uh, for various interfaces due to the contrast in electrical properties of the adjacent layers, which in this case is the rebarb and the concrete. A buried utility tends to appear as a 
distinct hyperbolic feature against the background, which you see here corresponding to each rebar pipe above. The most important properties here, though, are electrical conductivity and the dielectric constant. These two properties govern the ability of EM energy to penetrate a specific medium and the speed at which this EM wave propagates back through the medium. Here we have a table of examples of relative dielectric uh, constant of common materials. And moisture can also significantly affect these values. That's why um, you'll see for some of these, we have a range of values. Uh, for example, soil can vary uh, from four to 30. So the contrast in dielectric constant between the adjacent materials dictates the strength of the reflected energy to the surface where a larger difference in the value between the two materials will correspond to a better feature identification. So if you have a larger difference in dielectric constant between your ground and your pipe, you're going to see the utility better. Uh, here's an example of a real GPR scan. This is of two PVC pipes at five foot depth. Um, and they're shown here by those hyperbolic features um, that we saw here in the schematic. This is them in a real GPR scan. And there are there are downsides and cons to uh, to GPR. Um, since metals are perfect EM conductors, we can't image pipes that are buried beneath metal sheets or dense layers of steel pipes. And one of the biggest drawbacks that probably people are most familiar with is soils that contain significant amounts of moisture or clay tend to attenuate the EM wave, which can really limit uh, your accuracy of utility location. But if you have a pretty dry and non-clay condition, GPR is a very effective tool for locating various utilities. There's been a lot of advancements in GPR over the years, um, and one of the uh, biggest subjects of consideration is what GPR antenna configuration to use. Uh, you can either have a ground coupled um, or a air coupled system. And you can have a variety of configurations like single frequency, multi-frequency, or set frequency GPR. And I'm going to run through some of those so you can understand their difference. Single frequency GPR. So for these systems, we use single frequency antennas. An antennas. The appropriate antenna must be selected before you begin your application. So the user has to take into account the necessary frequency and potential access issues that the antenna may present since they vary in size. So when selecting your appropriate antenna frequency, uh, you really have to meet this balance between the depth of inspection that you're interested in and the precision of a measurement. Relatively low frequency antennas provide us a deep depth of penetration but at the cost of precision measurement. Whereas high frequency antennas uh, provide us with shallow depth of penetration and deliver high precision measurements. And the physical footprint really needs to be considered as well. Antennas for lower frequencies uh, can be quite large, uh, 10 feet or more, um, and can present challenges uh, in locating where a space is limited or you have uneven terrain. And here we have an example of a single frequency uh, ground coupled GPR system. I'm going to talk about multi frequency and a kind of multi frequency known as step or stepped frequency GPR. So, for systems that use multi channel antenna configuration, uh, the limitations that I just talked about of traditional single channel or single frequency antennas can be minimized or even completely overcome. Uh, these systems deploy multiple frequencies at once to capture data that balances a depth and precision to provide results for an optimal configuration. And this eliminates the need to purchase uh, signal frequency antennas or to perform multiple redundant passes over the same area with different antennas just so you could target different depths. Additionally, uh, multi-channel systems can deploy uh, multiple antennas in parallel. And this captures multiple scan paths simultaneously. And this significantly reduces downtime in the field. And this is critical in operations where we want to minimize that downtime, especially due to a road closure. And here we have an example of a multi-frequency GPR system uh, vehicle mounted that is air coupled. 
A little bit more about step or step frequency GPR. Uh, this scanning technique is really the most recent development in GPR technology. And as I said, with multi-channel uh, GPR, a range of desired antenna frequencies can be generated at high speeds, which overcomes a lot of those historical limitations observed uh, in traditional systems. So these GPR systems uh, can also be deployed using operator-driven approach for navigating difficult terrain or a vehicle-based approach, which helps us scan roadways at relatively high speeds. And this technology has undergone considerable research in the last two decades. It's even been developed into commercial products, uh, but availability and affordability uh, have been a major historical roadblock, as not a lot of vendors have been selling these systems. And the price of a step frequency GPR system can't always be justified over the cost of traditional systems. But recently, more vendors have come to market with competitively priced systems, uh, which make it a little more logistically friendly and uh, financially feasible for organizations. Also, software supporting uh, step frequency GPR provides automated analysis tools, uh, which can reduce uh, the amount of time an operator needs for training to be successful to deploy the system. And that was a robot that we learned about when we were talking to DOT offices when they uh, wanted to implement new systems. All right, moving on from GPR, we're going to talk about our next technology, which is frequency domain electromagnetic method. This is a geophysical MD technique that also uses electromagnetic signal uh, to detect and identify subsurface anomalies, and it's based on changes in electrical conductivity. This method tends to be used uh, in surveys to determine electrical properties of an area's given geology, but uh, since it has the ability to induce electrical currents in metallic targets, this allows for this technology to be used to locate buried utilities. Uh, these systems can be sensitive to surface conditions, though. Um, so, without or but with, if you have expert handling of the system and you can have a user with a high quality of data interpretation, uh, they can provide a reliable utility detection um, with at good speeds and with portable hardware. All right, so let's talk about how this works. In the photo, you see a long rectangular system that's held parallel to the ground. Uh, that same system is shown here in the schematic drawing. Right here is the same a rectangular system that we're seeing in the photo. And it has a T and an R on either end. FDM uses an enclosure uh, containing two separate electrical coils at either end. One coil acts as a transmitter, T, to send time-varying EM waves into the ground. Uh, while the other coil receives the response from the material and contents for processing, which is shown as the R, the receiver. And as the data is received, uh, the data acquisition system will actually present the user with a visual display about uh, showing the average conductivity taken as a function of time. Uh, these systems do often lack a physical encoder um, using instead a connected GPS device uh, so that the user can connect the measurements to a respective position uh, in their field experiments. Uh, local anomalies observed in conductivity measurements are used to identify the presence of the buried utilities. So the transmitter, receiver, and data acquisition are all operator portable uh, with an instrument held a few feet off the ground as you see in this photo. As with most NDE methods, FDEM is best utilized as a complementary tool rather than a standalone. So while uh, I do also want to talk about a, a technology that has grown out of FDEM, um, so traditional FDEM utilizes that pair of electrical coils, um, it has an operator that is having a portable enclosure carrying a, along a scan path by foot. But there has been a recent development of a complementary method called time domain electromagnetic method, or TDEM. This is a multi-channel vehicle-based system that can be used on roadways that can theoretically be used in place of FDEM. Uh, this deployment approach really boasts data collection at higher speeds and efficiency than traditional approaches as data is gathered from a moving vehicle with multiple sensors working in parallel, which really minimizes your number of collection passes. The major drawback, though, of TDEM is the initial cost 
of the sophisticated hardware unit and data acquisition software. But it should be on everyone's radar as an emerging technology of high value. All right, the third method that we'll be discussing is the acoustic pipe locator. Uh, using acoustic or seismic methods to detect underground utilities are especially useful in situations where GPR and EM methods fail due to soil properties, conductivity issues, uh, and electrical noise. So an APL uses an acoustic generator and a single geophone. The concept behind this method is that regions with more intense signals uh, received back into the geophone uh, or into the receiver correlate to anomalies and varied pipe locations. And this is uh, correlated to an impedance contrast between the buried utilities and the ground. You have in the photo here an APL field data collection system. And then in the schematic, you see that same system here over a scan path. Uh, and the user will follow that scan path to induce a ground vibration at a set interval along the path. And that set interval is shown here by those red points uh, shown as test points. Uh, the distance interval is dependent on the depth that you are interested in. Uh, you can see here in the schematic the outgoing vibration in blue and the received response in orange. Uh, detection results are prone to interference from noise, distortion, uh, from the surrounding material properties. And it's up to interpretation of the user. But APL are not limited to conductive pipes or soft soils, and they are ideal for shallow targets. Um, a range of frequencies from 50 to 150 hertz is most effective for pipe detection, although it really does depend on your soil type and target depth. And there are many commercially available APL systems that have visualization software directly on the APL system. But similar with FDEM, you're limited to an operator health system. So it can't be used on roadways at high speeds, but rather should be seen as a supplemental system when GPR and EM methods can fail. So the last of the methods uh, that we're gonna talk about is the multi-channel analysis of surface waves. So similar to acoustic technologies, seismic waves remain unaffected by wet soil conditions, like conductivity issues in GPR. MASW uses surface wave energy between 1 and 30 hertz on multi-channels with a minimum of 24 geophones. Now, surface waves are the largest amplitude uh, that you have in, a, in seismic phases. Um, so if you ever felt an earthquake and you feel first small vibrations followed by much larger vibrations, those are the surface waves coming through. Uh, so while MASW utilizes much smaller amplitude surface waves than we feel in earthquakes, they are the same seismic phase. So you can run MASW with an active or passive source, but an active source like a sledgehammer is ideal for imaging depth less than 100 feet, which is what we're interested in. Here's a photo on the right um, of a 24 geophone array laid across uh, pavement. And then in the schematic, you'll see those same geophones represented by the orange triangles or the orange rectangles uh, here on the surface. So the user is going to move the source, which is shown on that hammer here, uh, through the array of geophones, striking at various points, and then recording the size of waveforms. Analyzing the surface waves is particularly uh, advantageous because, like I said, they're large in amplitude. And this can provide a very ideal signal-to-noise ratio, especially when we're in urban areas or areas with elevated levels of mechanical or acoustic noise. Now, the disadvantage, or one of a few, is that there's no real-time data visualization. You can pull up the waveforms post each strike um, to make sure you're recording the data, but the waveforms alone are not identifying uh, the utilities for the user. The processing of that data works by leveraging that dispersive characteristic of surface waves as they travel through soil and anomalies, um, which in our case is buried utilities, and then the user will go back and generate dispersion curves uh, from the recorded waveform, invert those dispersion curves, and produce a 2D uh, shear wave velocity profile. And that's how we can identify these velocity anomalies. 
And MASW, in theory, uh, can work up to 100 feet in depth. In our uh, field experiments, we found it ideal between one and eight foot depth. At this point, we've gone through background information and an in-depth review of four promising MDA technologies and how they work. Now I'm going to briefly touch on a controlled lab experiment that we conducted under the federal highway contract to show a little bit more about how these work. We wanted to do an apples to apples comparison uh, of technologies. In the real world, we're affected by so many variables. We have varying moisture content, soil type, unidentified buried anomalies, weather. Uh, so to really do this apples to apples comparison, we built a matrix of specimens to assess the effectiveness of each NDE technology. Uh, these specimens were built and designed uh, at the at a North Carolina Department of Transportation uh, at a partly indoor facility that was covered but still exposed to humidity and temperature variations. So on the right, you'll see a schematic of soil-filled enclosures made from wood supports that were stacked on top of each other. Each raised bed consisted of a wooden frame uh, that was 12 foot by 5 foot by 1 foot. In the first layer, you see a number of pipes at the bottom. And we put nine pipes of varying materials and diameters in this enclosure. Uh, the pipes were actually slid into holes that, we, that were pre-drilled uh, on each side, entering one side and exiting the other. And we also had copper cable, fiber optic cable, steel pipes, PVC, and concrete. And these varied in sizes from a half an inch to an eight inch in diameter. Uh, and each enclosure consisted of stacking wooden frames so that we could change the depth and test each method at different depths. So when we only have two stacks on, we're looking at a one foot depth, three stacks, two foot depth, and so on, up to a six foot depth. So we did this for cohesionless, cohesive soils, and mixed soils, so that we can really understand the differences uh, that we were seeing from the methods and how to eliminate as many variables as possible. Here's a photo uh, to give you a little bit more context of the soil boxes being built. So I'm not going to go into uh, the results from this experiment uh, because of time, but I do encourage you, if you're interested, to see uh, what we did, especially with GPR and FDEM, where we saw a lot of success, um, to look out for the Federal Highway Report under this contract number listed here. Now I'm going to go through some field experiments that we conducted and results of some of the technologies that I've discussed with you today. We conducted a one-week field experiment in Virginia outside of Norfolk. We had three uh, field test sites, but the main limitation is that we were only able to gain access to PVC pipes for testing, which was disappointing uh, for us because we wanted to test uh, metallic methods as well. Uh, we had more limitations than anticipated with COVID. Um, we had hopes of traveling to multiple locations with varying geologies and pipe types uh, to really test these methods out fully but we made the best uh, with the three sites in Virginia. <clears throat> uh, on the right here is an example utility plan at one of the sites. Uh, we had both a sewer line and a water line that were PVC, uh, one that was four inches in diameter and one at eight inches in diameter uh, with ranging depths between three and 12 feet. And as you can see, we were in neighborhoods as well. So for GPR, we tested both dual frequency GPR and step frequency GPR. For dual frequency, uh, we used the GSSI utility scan GPR system, which is easy to operate, takes a signal technician, which can push the antenna cart along a scan line, like we talked about earlier, and they can review the data in real time. With this, we were able to detect about 60% of the shallow targets using the system, but had difficulty with the deeper depths um, because of the dual use nature of this uh, system, we could have had errors with the uh, frequency uh, frequencies that were chosen and the antennas that were chosen. Uh, the, for the step frequency GPR, the team deployed a 3D step frequency GPR system. Uh, this features a ground coupled antenna on multi-channel data acquisition. The 3D radar system is vehicle based and typically deployed for roadway and bridge inspections and it uh, makes it well suited for utility detection studies. 
It can uh, permit high-speed data collection and perform up to 28 scans in parallel over a single pass of location. But it can't be used on uneven or irregular terrain and must be deployed on established roadways. So while this is a great, great technology uh, for highway use and uh, continuous roadway use, as I showed you, we were in neighborhoods with a lot of our scan lines going from grass uh, over pavement back to grass, a lot of times on uh, properties. Um, this limitation hampered the use of the 3D radar system in our field test. So while it was successful over the, uh, over the roadways with our targets under grass and um, on neighborhoods, it was not always possible to test. Uh, here you see an example of the dual frequency uh, utility scan GPR system locating three uh, utilities uh, between three foot and about seven and a half feet with the two uh, frequency antennas that were used at 800 megahertz and 300 megahertz. So through this experiment, um, we were able to conclude that there's potential in using MASW to locate buried utilities. We ran a variety of setups uh, for MASW since it's not commonly used for utility detection. Uh, so we changed source layout, force weight, geophone type, and geophone spacing. Through all this, we determined that the best layout was doing what is called a full shoot-through approach across all 24 geophones, where you move along the source uh, between or at each geophone that remains fit. So in the top figure here, we have 24 geophones across, and each one of these is, a, is one individual test, the source moving between the geophone array. And then from all that information, we can take that back for data processing. And what you see below is a 2D shear wave velocity map uh, generated with uh, Parkside software, which is an MASW uh, analysis software package. Depth and feet, uh, you'll see versus depth in uh, surface systems. And so we expect to see these buried utilities as the low velocity zones uh, compared to the surrounding media, highlighted here with the black dotted circles um, are two potential pipes that are uh, one within two to three foot depth uh, that are in um, within two to three feet of the expected depth. So as you can also see, we're not able to resolve pipe diameter with MASW. These pipes are one four inches and one eight and eight inches, and they uh, look no different in their in their diameter size. So this can be seen as an emerging technology that should be further tested. Uh, to still prove its validity, but that should be on everyone's radar as an up-and-coming potential technology. Great. So we reviewed all the technologies, how they work, some applications of them uh, in the lab experiment and the field experiment, and now we're going to review our recommendations for various test conditions. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is a very brief overview of what is going to be provided in the Federal Highway Info Technology website in 2023. So I do encourage you to use that resource, which will detail which uh, all of the methods that I discussed and more, um, and the advantages and disadvantages, and when to use each method. As a summary, here are the methods that we talked about today, two kinds of GPR, acoustic methods, I didn't really go into magnetic detection or HVSR, um, but there's also FDEM, TDEM, and the seismic method, MASW. The most successful methods that we had in our controlled and field experiments were multi and step frequency GPR, MASW, and FDEM. So for those technologies, I'm going to go through each of these categories. Advantages, disadvantages, automation capabilities, our recommendation, suggested setups, and ideal conditions. So there'll be two slides for each method. So for GPR, for multi-frequency and step frequency, our advantages are that we can detect most kinds of utilities, metal and non-metallic. Uh, there's a high spatial resolution. It's GPS enabled already, already which is great for mapping capabilities. Uh, step frequency GPR has higher resolution than traditional GPR. It's reducing the amount of passes and scan paths that you have to do as well. And vehicle-driven GPR is highly effective for minimizing lane closures. And there's also wide market availability. Um, GPR systems have been around for a while and there's a lot um, on the market, especially up and coming systems like step frequency. 
Some disadvantages, they are highly sensitive to soil types uh, and electrical conductivity of the utility. Um, and depending what material is above, above that utility, if there is interference. And the signal can scatter when you have heterogeneous uh, subsurface conditions. And it can suffer, like I said, when there's nearby uh, conductive materials. Uh, automation capabilities. Uh, automation data acquisition is already available for, for GPR. You have real-time data visualization in three, three dimensions available to the operator as it's in use. Our recommendation is to use GPR for detecting varied utilities, uh, especially for metallic pipes, since you're going to have the highest dielectric constant contrast between soil and your pipe material. Suggested setup as a wide spectral band whenever possible uh, to prioritize frequencies in the 100 to 400 megahertz range. And obviously, when possible, to use an operator, or if you have rugged conditions, use an operator-driven GPR system. But if you can, use a vehicle mounted um, so you can do high-speed data collection and really reduce those road time closures. And then ideal conditions, which you know we never really get, but homogeneous soils uh, with little to no clay, dry environments, and flat and firm, even surface conditions. For SDEM, our advantages, again, continuous, continuous scanning, especially with TDEM, it's high speed scanning. Um, you're not limited by a regular surface condition as you can be with others as it's a for FDEM and operator portable system, and it uh, can be GPS enabled with a accompanying device. Uh, disadvantages, this only works for metals. Uh, you need to be able to conduct uh, an electric current through a pipe to be able to detect it with FDEM, so no PVC. And it can be sensitive uh, to heterogeneous soil conditions. Additionally, it really, you need an expert a user or operator to, to run this and set this up for calibration. There is uh, some automation capabilities already uh, showing the user in real time peak detection and recorded signals, which can help with uh, making uh, precise maps on site. Our recommendation is to use for shallow metallic pipes um, and a, a lack of real time data display reduces the effectiveness for utility location. But a lot of FDM methods do have an accompanying uh, real-time data display, just depends on which system you're using. Our suggested setup is to cycle through frequencies um, and so that you can uh, have the most effective for your specific utility type and to follow steps for the calibration of your instrument on a daily basis even, especially when errors are suspect, uh, suspected. And ideal conditions, uh, I mean, which we all hope for, but homogeneous soils, low clay, dry environments, flat and firm, even conditions are ideal, but not limiting for this. Uh, the seismic method, MASW, one of the biggest advantages is it's not limited by pipe conductivity or soft soil. You can identify plastic and metal targets under pavement and grass. And remember, seismic surface waves uh, are a large in amplitude, so it's you have good signal to noise ratio even in urban areas. This is ideal for shallow depth, uh, really between one and eight feet. Some of the disadvantages, uh, we can't resolve pipe diameter and depth precision is approximately plus or minus 60%. And it's a lot slower of a data acquisition method. Um, you have to lay out a multi geophone array, move your source through that array, collect the data and move on to the next scan path. Um, data processing still needs some improvements prior to commercial implementation, but there are a number of uh, MASW software analysis packages already available that are um, advanced, um, which is part of the automation capability. So while it's not on site, um, it is user friendly for, for someone who's not familiar with this software uh, to be able to run it. Our recommendation is that there should be further testing for MASW. We should look at different kinds of pipe types, different depths, different environments to really validate this method. Our suggested setup is using 24 geophones and that shoot through approach across the entire array. And the ideal force weight that we saw for pipes under 15 foot depth was between 1.5 and 4 pounds for your sledgehammer. Uh, ideal conditions, shallow depths, um, 
you can have the sensors on soil, grass, or asphalt, just depending if you have um, a geophone array or if you have spiked geophones. And there's ideal uh, situations to have a contrast between your utility and soil types. All right, so just going to talk through some uh, recommended next steps uh, for research and development. Uh, we want to perform further field evaluations for all NDE technologies really across a range of geologic environments. So that we're looking at high clay content and wet soil and different utility types. We don't want to just look at PVC pipes in similar geologies. We really want to expand that. Additionally, having uh, more of these real world experiments uh, would, would help as well. And we want to uh, recommend to continue investigating MASW. I'm curious also if others on this call have uh, tested MASW as a promising uh, complementary NDE technique. Another improvement could be developing ensemble techniques uh, to really boost utility detection and location performance with existing sensor technologies. And finally, some of these methods have great potential for automation capabilities. And work could be done to develop ensemble techniques uh, using ML methods to help keep up with processing demands. All right, some summary points. Um, using NDE technologies across various fields is critical to reduce outages and keep up with demanding needs for repair and upkeep utility lines. We discussed a lot of NDE techniques today. Some of the most promising in our experience was depth and multi-frequency GPR, FDEM, and MASW. And finally, I really want to uh, emphasize to utilize the Federal Highway Info Technology website uh, once it's updated with uh, the results from our study to learn more about current techniques, field experiments, data collection techniques, processing methods, and more. And with that, um, I'm going to take some questions. These are our upcoming webinars as well uh, at ARA, which we hope to have you attend as well. And thank you all for your time. So thank you, Vanessa. Very interesting presentation. Would you please go back to slide 52 for a minute? We went through that, 52. Thank you. So uh, those of you, uh, this is the fourth year of our webinar program. Those of you who are new to the program, uh, we're showing where you can register for the up and coming webinars. Before we get to the Q&A, uh, which we will in a moment, just want to mention these webinars. All of our webinars are presented by ARA employees from one of our 50 roughly offices around the country. So October 26, all the webinars are always on a Wednesday, strategies to improve transportation operations. And our speaker will be Aaron. On November 30th, uh, speaker will be Ahmad and Ahmad will be addressing risk-based asset management for geotechnical features endearingly known as GAM. And then in December, uh, middle of December, due to the holiday season, uh, Tenzilla will be presenting experimental and numerical performance of cement bonded geomaterials stabilized with plastic waste. Next slide, please. And we, we do have a number of questions and Vanessa has been gracious like all of our presenters. She will uh, accommodate questions on the content of today's webinar for approximately 48 hours, so two days after today. Uh, we'll have a number of questions. Please don't put your questions in the form of consulting. That, that really would not be appropriate. But uh, obviously, Vanessa is quite learned about the items that we've heard about today. So I'd like to get into the questions with Vanessa with the time that remains. If we don't get into all, if we can't accommodate all the questions with the remaining time, then we will, um, Vanessa will get back to you. Uh, after the program. So the first question is from Julian, and Julian would like to know, Vanessa, if you can from memory, uh, tell them, tell us who the nine state DOTs were that you contacted. Um, we're actually not going to divulge that information. Uh, that was part of our discussion when we met with the DOTs that we would meet with them and not publish their specific uh, amounts publicly, but in the Federal Highway Report that we're publishing, they are listed. So all I can say is stay tuned. Um, and if I hear uh, differently from our Federal Highway Project Manager, um, if you follow up with me, I can, I can provide the nine states if, if allowed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Mark. 
And in slide nine, you showed a GPR equipment. And Mark's question is, was that um, equipment, ARAs, air coupled, 3D radar system, and a collection vehicle? You don't have to go all the way back there, but maybe you can. Right. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so this this is not air raise. This is uh, our sub our sub uh, air coupled vehicle mounted system. They are bridge diagnostics or BDI, uh, more well known as, and they ran a lot of the GPR testing. So this is their vehicle mounted ARA. Um, did not provide a GPR for for this analysis. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question from Julian. And relative to GPR, what Julian like to know is. Do you need to know the soil conditions or the dielectric constant at the specific location in order to determine the depth of the utility when using GPR? You, you don't need to know it ahead of time. Um, there's obviously an ideal situation where you have an idea of the depth of the utility you're looking at or you have an idea of the soil conditions. Um, but it does not need to be known prior uh, prior to it. Um, you could run into problems where you don't have a strong difference in dielectric constant. If you have a really saturated soil and a PVC pipe, they could be near the same dielectric constant, so you might not great, get great resolution. Um, the other thing is uh, with multi-frequency and step-frequency GPR, you have the advantage without having to hone in on a specific frequency or depth, so you don't have to pick the specific antenna ahead of time and you can sweep through a range of frequencies like between 100 megahertz and 400 megahertz which can sweep through multiple depths at once okay great and would you mind vanessa please going back to slide 53 the q a um, reminder slide and we have a question from richard and richard would like to know what is the range of high speed scanning range in, in what uh in, in frequency range or i it, it's not clear uh what he's asking so i i guess there's two ways to interpret that what is the range of speed and then secondly what is the frequency range so and he can follow so up speed, richard please do if you'd like yes yeah. please go ahead um so speed uh can vary. Uh, my, my experience is that you should still keep a relatively low pace speed when possible, um, 45 miles an hour per hour or so. Um, I'm also, I would encourage, I can follow up more with bridge diagnostics about the maximum speed of their 3D radar system, which is vehicle mounted. Um, it is also, the frequency range is an ultra wideband frequency spectrum, so really between 200 megahertz and 3 gigahertz, so really wide uh, frequency spectrum, which really helps when you're looking at a range and depth and uh, utility. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question next from Paul, and the question is, which technology is best suited to identify vertical positioning of steel piling? Sometimes we need to place tiebacks through a bridge abutment, pile group, and need to know where the piles are located? Oh, that's a really good question, Paul. Um, we did not investigate any vertical uh, pipe detection, so we only did parallel to the surface. Um, it's, as I'm sure you're asking this question for, you know, vertical identification is difficult since you only have a very shallow or very narrow target that you're investigating now. It can be, it's just the diameter of the pipe. Um, a lot of the methods that we looked at um, are dependent on having a scan path, like I talked about. So GPR, where you're scanning over the length of the pipe and you're uh, looking at multiple uh, scan paths and same with SEM and even MASW and ACL. Um, so I don't have a great answer off, off the top of my head for you, unfortunately, Paul. Uh, that is definitely a problem and, and one that may actually require uh, not using ND methods, but using excavation methods for uh, where you can uh, use an acoustic ex uh, excitation method, for example, where you can uh, get onto hook onto the top of the pipe and then locate the rest of the depth and the path of the pipe once you have um, access to it. Okay. Um, next question. It, it, it's to the piling question. It's also complicated by the fact that it's not a single row of piles, and not all the piles are vertical. So it is a complicated problem. But uh, interesting question. Next question is from Richard, and Richard's question is: Can GPR be successfully used when a tracer wire is present? Um, I don't know if that's 
I don't have an immediate answer for that. I, I believe it can be, but we didn't test that in this in this experiment. Um, CPR in general can be uh, affected by by uh, you know objects around it, but I, I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Uh, if a trace of our, if you send me an email, though, I'll, I'll talk back to our GPR experts um, and and try to get you an answer for that. Okay, thank you. We have a question from James. Uh, and so if you were to purchase a complete hardware and software unit for each type of geophysics to find most utilities, what would be the cost? Mm. Oh. That's a tough uh, one as well. That is, it is. And so I, I will say this, it is heavily dependent on what kind of system you're buying. Um, oh, ones that GPR that are integrated with their software and hardware in one system. Well, what kind of GPR are we looking at? Are we looking at single frequency, multi, dual? Um, there are a number of commercially available GPR um, systems now. Um, I do encourage you to, to do that research. A lot of them will actually have available quotes or easily accessible quotes uh, from sales reps. Um, and then that'll change if you're not doing GPR, if you're looking at an MASW system, I mean, you got to buy 24 geophones, a seismograph, a laptop, and then the associated software. Um, I can tell you for this experiment with the equipment that we rented, um, there's rental equipment. Um, it was about two grand for the rental for two weeks and um, about a thousand dollars for the software rental. Um, so if you wanted to test out the method, that's an approximate cost, but um, I would encourage you to look at a commercially available system then and talk to their sales reps as their numbers are also constantly changing. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question and we have a question from Catherine. Can you explain what MASW is typically used for and why it isn't more commonly used for utility detection? Definitely. Um, so MASW was published back in 1999 by Dr. Parchun. Um, it's typically and traditionally used for like bedrock profiling, um, calculating soil properties, uh, mapping bedrock and geologic mapping. And it was, it's been very successful in that. And so there was a paper, uh, I think it was in 2010 by Miller et al, applying the MASW to utility detection. So it's really been in the past 12 or 13 years that this has been open for discussion of utility detection, but there's still limited resources on this and the efficacy of it, which is why we're encouraging other folks and us to continue testing this method as it uh, does seem to have complementary uh, capabilities to uh, GPR and other methods. Okay, thank you. If we did not have time, I'm we're out of time for Q&A to answer your questions. Vanessa, we'll get back to you. We have all the questions recorded. Can I have the next slide, please? So, uh, on behalf of ARA, I want to thank you again for all joining us today. Hopefully, we'll see you in the future. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth year of our monthly program. Uh, we've been very pleased with its success. Today's presentation is being recorded. I mentioned that uh, previously, and a link will be made available at the ARA Webinar Wednesday website early next week. Those of you who attended the entire program are entitled to receive a, a PDH certificate. And uh, again, that will be, uh, takes a little bit longer for us to uh, provide that information. Please allow three weeks for that. And you're also entitled to receive a PDF version of today's program prepared by Vanessa. Next slide, please. Oh, ARA is, uh, is a great company. I'm on my third career after retirement from the government and the National Academy of Sciences. And I've been here, it's hard to believe, nine years. We're always looking for extremely talented, hardworking, and people that like science and engineering for fun and profit. So. Uh, you see on this slide, we have, if you're interested in the existing opportunities within our transportation and infrastructure sector, please visit this site and uh, visit it frequently because our needs change, but we're always looking for great people in one of our 50 offices. Next slide, please. Thank you again. Have a blessed day. And thank you again, Vanessa, for today's program.